Welcome back to another episode of the Casey Campbell podcast. Casey Campbell with you, of course. We are pleased to be joined um, by Dylan Murray, of course, a good friend of the channel. Um, Dylan, uh, of course, will. yeah, you're going to be at Rolex. Yeah, you're with the team, but you're not going to be competing. Well, just kind of explain what you're doing. Yeah, so, you know, for, for this Rolex, um, it's going to be my first time in a couple of years not competing in the Rolex 24, but I will be with Andretti Autosport as their reserve driver. Um, and so it's really, you know, to be with a team, uh, with the name of Andretti and you look at everything that they've done, not just as the, the drivers, but the team itself, everything that, that auto Andretti Autosport's doing, um, it's, it's so good to be with a team like that, you know, to have them in, in Jerry Andretti is really, he's, he's really been super supportive of me and it's been really great to, to be part of this team for, for the next couple of weeks. And um it's yeah it's it's really amazing to have someone of that caliber to say yeah we we trust you enough let's let's come and be be our reserve driver for for daytona and so it's um i think it's it's it is definitely a step in the right direction even though i'm not driving but to be with a team that has so many different things you know such as formula e formula one now they've just announced um and gtp and indycar and all these things to be with a team like that I would say that's, um, you know, that's, that's one of the best things that's happened to me so far. So I think it's, it's definitely a step in the right direction for sure. Well, kind of explain what you're going to be doing down there at Rolex. So like what your role is, because you're going to be with the team um, with doing, help them out with a lot of things. So kind of just kind of explain what you kind of do. Yeah. So I will be um, in the meantime, I'll be spotting. So they've got me set up with uh, like a spotting equipment and stuff. So when I'm not driving, um, I'll be up there spotting at the top for everybody else. Um, and but other than that, I'll be in there all their debriefs. So I'm still up to date on everything that's going on. Um, I'll just be hanging around the team, you know, all the time and just being being involved in, in kind of uh, involved with their world to bond with the the crew and the other drivers and, and everybody, the engineers, um, just so, you know, I, I kind of become sucked into part of the team in a bit. Yeah. So that's going to be something. Have you ever spotted for somebody? So I spotted for the Whelan uh, Action Express car at Petit Le Mans last year because, um, you know, things happened with our team that we weren't able to to make petite um and so i was just you know going up there and just talking to different people and and the wheel and team they offered for me to spot for them because just you know i had really nothing else to do um so i went out and i spotted for them and i was kind of nervous to be honest because i'd never spotted before that and here is a team like action express and dpi and they're fighting for the championship and for the win and i'm like i'm sitting here like okay I'm a driver. I'm not a spotter by any means. And I know when I have a spotter in my ear, how important that is. And if I lose concentration for just one split second and there's another DPI that shoves it in there right in turn two and I don't see it. And then something happens or a GT car spins and I don't see it. Something happens. That's a lot of pressure on me. And I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I want to take this pressure, um, but I did it. And I was, you know, it, it, it took a couple practice sessions to really get dialed in. Um, but it really is. It's surprising spotting how involved it is mentally for your concentration to be all the time just on it, knowing everything that's going on on track. Because when you're driving, you're focused on just you and your engineer and your race strategist are telling you, OK, if you're going to pit this lap. We're going to do this. You're just focused on driving just you, nobody else. But when you're spotting, you have to know everything that's going on on the track and like, so I had in, in my ear, I had in one, in my left ear, I had the team radio, the car radio. And then in my right ear, I had IMSA race control. And then in both ears, I had a separate earplug that was on the timing stand. So I can hear what everybody's talking about on the timing stand that the driver doesn't hear. So I'm listening to three things at once. At the same time, I'm watching the ants and timing and scoring. The ants are, you know, you have the track map and uh, you, you follow all the GTs and DPIs and LMP2s and stuff where they're at on track. Um, and at the same time, you know, I'm looking, constantly scanning the track for anybody that's spun or crashed or anything. Um, so I can give the driver, whoever the driver is at the time, a heads up of what's going on. Um, so it really is. And you're doing that. I was the only spotter for Petite. So that was 10 hours straight that I had to do that. And you're really 
concentrated the whole time. And, you know, as soon as you see a yellow flag, a, a full course caution come out, you dart to the nearest porta potty and, and try to relieve yourself before you come back and, and go, go at it in because you don't know when the next caution is and um, try to limit your fluid intakes. So just kind of talk about what's going to, because obviously for the Rolex 24, I know every single spotter in America, whether you're an IndyCar, whether you're an IMSA, or whether you're in NASCAR, um, you're, there's a good chance that you're probably going to be down there for a team. Uh, just kind of talk about what it's going to be like going down there because you're, you're going to be in shifts. Obviously, you'll have, you know, breaks in between um, so that you can rest and then you'll be back at it pretty soon. What's that going to be like for you? Yeah, so for Petit, when I spotted, it was just me. Um, but for Daytona, we have another spotter. So we will be um, splitting that time. You know, obviously for 24 hours, you got to split up. So we haven't decided the shifts yet, but we'll probably end up doing six hour shifts or eight hour shifts or something like that. Um, or even four hour shifts might, might be enough. Um, but we'll, so we'll be splitting and it's a bit different at Daytona because at road Atlanta, you're spotting, you really just see a couple of corners, you know, you see down the S's and stuff. That's where I was, but at Daytona, it's probably going to be even more involved because now you're at the top at the roof of the grandstands and you can see everything on the track. So you always have to be, watching that car and you really have to i think the the most interesting thing is you have to learn what your car looks like from a distance and some cars once it becomes nighttime it's really difficult to to figure out who's who especially when the headlights are coming right at you and that's when your focus really needs to be on point is to see you know like when you're at the top of the grandstands i can only imagine again i haven't done it yet but i can only imagine when the cars are coming around nascar four coming back at you and you're at the top of the grandstands, you see nothing but headlights. And if there's, you know, your car, which is you know, going to be Andretti for me, um, and then a couple of DPIs and, and or GTP now, and LMB2s and GTs, and it's like you, all these headlights besides um, GTD AM that have the yellow headlights, all of them look very close to the same. Um, so it's so tough to see who is who. Um, and so I think that's that's really going to be the the difficult part to get used to is, you know, just making sure that you're on top of it all the time. Yeah, for sure. Um, I don't know. It's like if you keep doing this, you know, NASCAR teams are probably going to contact you. It's like, yeah, we need a spotter out there for one of our road course races or something. Uh, <laughs> Hopefully to drive instead of spot, though. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, I mean, have you ever thought about doing, you know, I know that sports cars is your thing, obviously, you know, you come from a racing family, of course, all the success that your dad has. Um, I was watching the broadcast last year. Like, how do you get ready for a race? Because I know the broadcast, I don't know if you watched the broadcast back over again, but they did mention a couple things that you'd like to do. Yeah, I, um, I may be a bit, I guess you could say a bit more extreme than most drivers um, as far as what I do to prepare for a race. Um, you know, obviously the commentators, they always love to make fun of me for eating sardines and drinking beet juice. Um, that is, that's my, that's my, uh, it used to be my pre-race meal. It's not anymore because eating two cans of sardines and then going over a bunch of bumps at 200 miles an hour, that doesn't sit well in your stomach. No. So I don't do the sardines anymore. I do something a bit lighter than sardines with not as much, you know, juice and fat and fishy taste to it. Um, but I do eat a lot of sardines before a race. Um, it just has so many vitamins and, and fish oils and stuff and minerals in it. Um, and then as far as the beet juice goes, same thing for that. But for Daytona specifically, every year I always do um, a, a kind of like a really mock type 24 hour race. So what I'll do is I will, as soon as I get, or even sometimes before I get the race draft from a team or I'll go off the previous year race draft is before the 24, I'll look at when I would estimate it be in the car and I will set my alarm and I'll do based off of when green flag is and when checkered flag is for the race. I will have the race on, like I'll pull it up on YouTube from last year. I'll have the 24 hour race on the whole time on my TV and I will uh, set my alarm for whenever I get in the car and I'll get up. I'll do like a, a one to two hour, depending on how long my stint is. If I do a single stint or a double stint or a triple stint, sometimes I'll do a one to two hour exercise, whether that's jump rope, bike, push ups, pull ups, whatever it is, something that gets your heart rate up, something that gets you awake. 
and I'll do that for a couple hours. And sometimes I'll get on the simulator. I've got a SimCraft uh, at home. So some, every now and then I'll hop on the simulator instead of doing an exercise um, just to keep your mind working, get on that schedule. So you understand what it's like to be sleep deprived, worn out physically and worn out mentally while still trying to give everything that you've got. Um, and even while I sleep, those quick little cat naps that I have, because of the track, you're in an RV and you're not too far from the track and you hear nothing but these DPIs or now again, GTP and GTD cars and LMP2 cars and LMP3 cars going by and it's so tough to sleep. And so what I found that really helps me with that is I will turn on, like I got a big speaker that I put right next to my bed and I found this playlist on YouTube. And it's just 13 hours straight of, of car sound, race car sounds. And so I'll turn that on pretty loud and try to sleep with that. It's really difficult to sleep with it that loud. Um, but it really gets you neat. This playlist, it even has like cautions in it and stuff. So every now and then the cars will get quiet. And it's like, oh, I can sleep. And then all of a sudden green flag comes. And, no, you're not. And so I'll put that on while I try to sleep set an alarm every couple hours to wake up, do a workout, then go back to sleep or try to go back to sleep. Um, and it's really good mock for mental train. It's, it's more for mental than physical, because I think physically you don't really gain much because you actually need more recovery than that. You're probably overworking yourself, but for the mental aspect of it, it really prepares you. And that's really the best thing to do for a race like Daytona or Le Mans is to have something to where because it's, it's all mental you know i mean you're so concentrated you're so worn out by the end that you need to be prepared of what it's going to feel like because towards the end of the race you're going to be like why am i out here this is you know i'm I, my body's toast my mind's toast i'm tired i'm dehydrated um all i want to do is just have this race finished and go to sleep um and so that's that's where the mental aspect comes in is you know being able to push through it and give a hundred percent because if you don't do that, you're not mentally prepared. You're going to give 99% at the end while one of your competitors is going to give a hundred percent and then they're going to get a watch while you're not. Um, so that's, that's, that's my pre-race for Daytona. It's, it's pretty specific to Daytona. Um, I'll do something similar for Sebring, uh, not quite as extensive because it's not quite as um, sleep depriving as Daytona. Um, but it's definitely, yeah, that's definitely my 24 hour prep. Yeah, for sure. Um, let me ask you this, and just um, just what's it going to take to uh, win? What's it going to take to win this race? You think? It, you know, my first twenty four hour, I thought that it was going to be a more conserve your brakes, conserve your tires, conserve your fuel. You know, don't hurt the car, don't be too aggressive. Um, I was genuinely surprised with how much people were pushing in the race like my first stint out in the race i was like all right here we go you know it's a 24 hour race you know let's kind of make sure that we don't do any make any mistakes or do anything and just save it for the end and i was like wait these guys are actually they're pushing and not only are they pushing when they're by themselves they're fighting each other in through the corners and everything um, and so it's not that way that it used to be back in you know 1980s 1990s and 2000s where you have to make your car last. I mean, these cars will last. And now it's who can push the closest to the limit without crashing the car um, throughout the entire 24 hours. That's who's going to win. And it is, it, it's not an endurance race anymore. It is a sprint race that just happens to last 24 hours. Um, and it's, it's definitely, it requires the whole team um, to push. Every, every driver, every crew member, every tire changer and fueler, everything has to be spot on um, and you're pushing for 24 hours straight. It's, it's not an endurance race anymore. I can tell you that. Yeah, for sure. All right. Well, Dylan Murray, thank you so much for coming on and talking with us and best of luck. Um, uh, best of luck at the Rolex 24 uh, next weekend. Yeah. Thanks very much for having me on here.